spiders, snakes, and sharks. Three of the scariest creatures committed to film, other than man, of course. While one is terrifying while crawling up your backside, one slithering towards you with ill intent, one of these only really exists in one single setting. The deep blue sea. As someone who's made a lot of videos about thalassophobia, horror, and things I am genuinely afraid of, I've always wondered about the ocean and still have a fascination with its deadliest inhabitant, the shark. Growing up in Australia, there would be yearly warnings about going to the beach, where the biggest cause of death was often a riptide, which actually could kill you quicker than almost any shark, but each year a new story would pop up about someone seeing a shark, not necessarily an attack, just a sighting, just on a beach, just somewhere between the flags, a sighting of a creature that literally only attacks less than 200 people globally on a yearly basis. While more than 12% of those attacks do actually occur here in Australia, 80% of those attacks usually happen because they're provoked by a swimmer or a boat or a poacher or somebody who's genuinely just trying to annoy the shark. And while I'm largely aware of this fact, logic and fear, like oil and water, very rarely mix well together. And all of those fears frankly come down to one film, one single cinematic experience which took place in the late summer of 1999 when I was just eight years old. My family had chosen to see Deep Blue Sea at the Huskisson Pictures, a small movie house located in the south coast of New South Wales. Just an old style picture theatre with a little candy bar here and I was scared to death when the lights went down and the movie came to life in what was truly a transcendent, mesmerising and terrifying experience that posited the question, what if sharks were smarter than you could ever possibly be? That's right, today as you can tell from the title of this video, we're about to answer that question with the movie Deep Blue Sea, its legacy, and the fact that there's somehow three of these fucking movies. Yeah, I didn't know until like a year or two ago that there's three of these films, two of which essentially just went to VOD. The last of which was actually released middle of the pandemic, which we'll get into all of that. We'll also be answering the question, are these films any good? Is this franchise worth holding on to? And are they actually worth watching? I, I, I will obviously talk about all three individually, but let's dive in look at this franchise as a whole, and answer the question, what are these films actually about, if anything, at all? I just want to say, because I get to really talk about stuff that I actually love on this channel, and I really, really do love Deep Blue Sea. I cannot overstate harder, louder, or quicker that Deep Blue Sea, for a long time, was my favourite film as a teen. It was up there with Fight Club and The Matrix and Akira and The Animatrix as the best movies of all time. Now, I... <laughs> I have changed my tastes over time, you should. I watched this film with my wonderful partner, who had never seen it before, never heard of it, and her main quote throughout the entire film was, I've never seen anything more chaotic or traumatic in my life. And just kept asking, you watched this when you were eight? Now, like, it, she's not a, a plebeian. She's not just like someone just off the street, just watching, you know, whatever. Like, we've watched Uncut Gems dozens of times. We love Uncut Gems. We love that film so much that we have this uncut mug right here. But she was so stunned of everything happening every five to ten minutes that honestly felt like how I felt watching it as a kid. Now, for those who have been living in a sea laboratory for the last 24, 25 years, Deep Blue Sea is a really simple story that confronts one of the oldest themes and one of the greatest questions in film and storytelling. Why aren't sharks smarter? But seriously, while in 1999 you had films like The Matrix tackling man versus machine from a technological level, or man versus himself in something like uh, Bing John Malkovich, Deep Blue Sea tackled the classic trope of man versus nature, a great concept that goes all the way back through the annals of history, even down to something like Moby Dick. Deep Blue Sea is about one very determined woman, Dr. Susan McAllister, played by staring contest winner from 1999 to 2016, Saffron Burroughs. Susan is a ruthless scientist scientist and shark manager who helps run an underwater research laboratory known as Aquatica. And when a single shark escapes from her research lab, her main investor, Russell Franklin, played here by the always brilliant Samuel L. Jackson, is brought in to survey an upcoming breakthrough on her Alzheimer's research to make sure his investment is safe. However, things are not what they seem at Aquatica. With her ragtag group of an engineer and a wrangler and a marine biologist and a doctor and a chef and all these other people, they begin to notice strange things are happening with the sharks that they are experimenting on. Now, to start with a very important question, does Deep Blue Sea have any legacy? I would say, personally, the film is great. I think that that from a general horror action adventure standpoint, it's freaking brilliant. I think that there's a lot of stuff that gets nailed in this opening setup, this whole sequence here, which lasts actually only like 
three, four minutes in total. It's a bit exposition heavy, but in less than two minutes, you know the stakes, you know who they are, you know where they're going, you know the main five questions are answered. Who, what, where, why, and how. Oh, and I totally forgot about this incredible cold open bit, which scared the shit out of me with these, the shark attacks a boat full of teens. It, it's so terrifying when he breaks through like, the, oh my God. I, <laughs> I remember watching this film with my parents and my mother was sitting next to me and this single part here where the wine rolls off and falls in I leaned over to my mom and was like that shark's gonna get drunk and I made a little joke about like what a drunk shark would look like and she laughed out loud and I felt as though hey you know what this film's gonna be creepy you know I'm gonna be okay if I can crack jokes at it I didn't realize that this film was, to some degree, psychologically scarring for me. When I was eight, I did go through a phase where sharks and movies about sharks were just inherently cool. And I was very too young to watch. I have a clear, distinct memory of being in the video store and asking my parents if I can watch Jaws. And they were like, no, you won't like it. You won't understand it. Which I think at eight years old, they were 100% right. I would not get the cinematic techniques. I wouldn't get the dialogue, how amazing it is, or the characterization, or the camera work, or the structure. Or In fact, most of the film is pretty much not about the shark or the attacks. It's about a man trying to take care of his wife and his sons and trying to basically just deal with this crisis that's happening at a beach that he's meant to take care of but for something like deep blue sea which was a fine afternoon matinee with my family i understood deep blue sea i knew that this film was gonna be intense because i watched every tv spot i watched every trailer because i was just a weird kid like that i i had a diary and the only thing i really put in my diary was birthdays and when movies and TV shows were coming out. I kind of still do that now, but I just I just have a Google Calendar and I just do that. Little would I actually know that this film would make me terrified of the ocean. This film would give me thalassophobia for years to come. I loved going to the beach as a young kid, but as I got into my teens, I started going less and less just because I got scared. I genuinely was terrified that there was going to be a shark out there. I, little uh, would I know that how this film actually came to be, or even how great the film is and I, and I think that yes there is a nostalgia to this I've watched this film at least three dozen times in the past two decades but on my recent watches there's heaps of stuff that I've totally forgotten like the fact that Preacher says that he's a father and a husband I there's nothing much else that alludes to that except for like there's literally only like three lines of dialogue which is crazy or the fact that Thomas Jane is a, an ex-felon and there's this weird bit of dialogue between him and Sam Jackson well a man's always got a file what to say two years Leavenworth smug me how'd you make your money man you the first rich guy in history you squeak it clean you do understand my concern right and I totally don't remember that at all and that's why i love these retrospectives going through films that i have watched a couple of times especially since my younger years and being like oh yeah wow did not remember that or remember seeing that whatsoever but again but that does ask the question is there a legacy to this film is there a reason why there's some sequels well let me give you a wider context for 1999 1999 in cinema has been described as the greatest year in film in fact this this book here best movie year ever fantastic book i read it a couple of years ago and it goes through what is pretty much from 1997 all the way up to 2000 a watershed moment in cinematic if not artistic history looking at deep blue sea which isn't frankly mentioned at all in the book it has a wider context in the fact that it did very well for a horror creature feature action adventure romp essentially and it beat out the Academy Award winners like American Beauty, which honestly, to, the less we say about that, the better. Oscar nominees like South Park, Big Longer and Uncut, and The Green Mile. The cult classics like End of Days, Eyes Wide Shut, Fight Club, and even Pokemon the first movie. At the height of Pokemania, Deep Blue Sea beat out all of those films. It did quite well to say the least. It grossed 73 million domestically in the US on a $60 million budget. That was great. The film opened at number two against The Haunting, a largely forgettable horror remake by another amazing action director, Young Bond, based on the book Haunting of the Hill House, which had a far better adaptation on Netflix almost 20 years later by the incredible horror screenwriter and filmmaker Mike Flanagan. Now, the film was met with a very mixed critical reception. You can see here the Rotten Tomato score, and the audience score, and the Letterbox score. At the time, a lot of people obviously decried the film as a mediocre Jaws ripoff, and that, you know, it, it, a lot of comparisons to Jaws, and a lot of comparisons to, at the time, what was a burgeoning re-evaluation on creature features. Uh, obviously, starting with Jurassic Park in 1994, you had the likes of Anaconda in 1998, with this coming out in 1999, Bats, there was a few other films that came out in the early 2000s, kind of going back on that 
that creature feature success. But I will say that the film is not like Jaws for a range of reasons. However, I do get the comparisons. It's a shark film. It's technically a horror film. It's technically an action film. There's a lot of great moments in this film, but I would not say it's as good as Jaws. That's just a fact. I'm sorry. I will say that for a film that came out in 1999, it's pretty great and a lot of stuff holds up. And we'll talk more about that later on. I will say when it came out, the film stayed in the top 10 box office for more than a month until two of the greatest horror films of all time came out in the few short months between Deep Blue Sea and the end of the millennium. Of course, I'm talking about The Blair Witch Project and The Sixth Sense, two films that also scarred me and terrified me, but for different reasons. And if you want to hear me talk about that, maybe uh, subscribe to my Patreon. But anyway, here's where we ask the main question, how did this film actually come about? So let's go all the way back to the early 1990s to find out when that happened and why that happened. How did Deep Blue Sea came to be? Yeah, that makes sense. It came from this man. This is Duncan Kennedy. Back in the 90s, Duncan was a graduate from Queensland University of Technology and had come out to Los Angeles to sell a bunch of spec scripts. One of them was based off a traumatic experience he had witnessed on a beach in Queensland. In the 1980s, Kennedy, speaking with Bloody Disgusting in 2021, had a combination of experience that helped influence the main conceit of the film that is Deep Blue Sea. The first was booking a trip to Middle Island with his wife and hiring a dinghy to reach the island. Upon arrival, Kennedy had noticed that the eerie tunnels from the abandoned underwater Water observatory ran along the island and were just kind of creepy, terrifying liminal spaces. Days later, after the trip, Kennedy stayed on a beef farm where he was speaking with a local farmer about how genetically modified growth hormone shots were being used on their cattle. And the side effect was that the cattle were now more aggressive. And just like that, to quote Kennedy, Deep Blue Sea was underway. While Kennedy was trying to make a name for himself as a writer, he eventually wrote a spec script that she sold in 1994, but the project would not start to formulate until 1996. In between that time, Rennie Harlan, the man who would go on to direct Deep Blue Sea, had one of the worst years of his career and life. He releases Cutthroat Island in 1995, a film that up until 2010 had the Guinness World Record for the biggest box office bomb of all time. A film so bad that it stopped pirates from essentially existing in cinema until 2003 when Jerry Bruckheimer decided to create the Pirates of the Caribbean films. Luckily for Rennie, he had another film ready to shoot, The Long Kiss Goodnight, a fantastic cult classic feature Samuel L. Jackson and Gina Davis. The film was released just about 10 months after Cutthroat Bombs and Harlan bounces back pretty quickly. But then again, he doesn't make another film until 1999. In the meantime, Deep Blue Sea is being passed around to a bunch of screenwriters and ends up in the lap of TV writing duo Donna and Dwayne Powers. And by the time that they had finished it, Rennie Harlan was ready to sign on. However, to quote Wayne Powers, speaking to Joe Blow Movies, originally the film had a lot more military espionage. There were like grenade launchers, but they wanted to include more blue collar types and not have weapons to fight back and play the film as a horror flick. The horror angle was perfect and was a huge focus for Rennie Harlan, someone who had initially cut his teeth on the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise back in the 80s. He wanted to focus on this and make it a large selling point of the film. Little did Harlan know that horror was about to go through a very significant dynamic shift right under his feet. Production of Deep Blue Sea began in April of 1998 with Rennie Harlan setting out this huge scale horror film, but he wanted to cast the film in the same way that they had cast the first Alien film. And again to quote Rennie Harlan, where you had no idea who was going to die. One of the biggest and oddest, but frankly one of the best casting choices was rapper LL Cool J. LL Cool J was brought into the production and very, very late into the script and even had the script changed because Rennie Harlan liked him so much. Rennie Harlan is quoted saying, I wanted to have one character who brings a lot of warmth and humor to the film without it being a joke type humor. He was originally going to be shark meat quite early on, but he was so good we had to keep him around. Yes, that is the power of ladies loving Cool James. With production starting in the same big ass water tank that they filmed Titanic in, Things were chaotic from the get-go. First of all, Rennie Harlan intentionally asked to create an animatronic shark that was specifically 26 feet long because, and I do quote again, Bruce the shark was 25 feet long. Honestly, there is a big difference in the real and the CGI sharks in the film, but this animatronic shark, which actually took eight months to make, looks incredible, especially the close-ups. It's terrifying. It's fucking, it's it's horrifying. It really does look like, like a big fish, essentially. It wasn't easy to notice as a kid, but as an adult, it actually does make a difference compared to the CGI ones, which, look, I'll be honest, do look pretty good when they're in the water and swimming around in the dark, but 
look a little bit fake close up. It's one thing that I have to note really, really well is the amount of practical and physical work that a lot of the actors and obviously the animatronic work does, including Thomas Jane having to literally swim alongside a living tiger shark, something that happens in the film. One of my favorite sequences of the film is, and there's a lot of them, one of my favorite sequences of the film is when the team are trying to get an injured scientist safety and looking at it, it is very chaotic and it's horrible and I had no idea how much went into the sequence. I, I did so much research for this and, and honestly it's my favorite part of doing these video essays but there was, a, there was a quote from Samuel L. Jackson in the Las Vegas Sun of all places. Samuel L. Jackson says that this sequence was no joke. They were throwing tons of water against all of the actors and it's salt water. It's just salt water. It's not, it's not just like regular water, bath water, tap water. It's salt water and it's just just hitting them in the face. Also, they have no safety harnesses on. There's no stunt actors. It's literally the actors themselves. And the sequence of the film was literally just what you saw. It's just that the actors slipping and sliding and the waves running up and down with like a fake wave machine. Samuel L. Jackson didn't think they would keep these shots in the film, that they would cut around it, they would just cut to these helicopter shots. Maybe they would just, I don't know, CGI some stuff. But the whole sequence was kept into the film down to the wire where Jackson saw the film at a screening and again, quote, oh, they kept it? It looked really good. Now, just to round off a few other fun bits of trivia, I will say I did get some of this from obviously Wikipedia and IMDb. Try not to source too much from there because IMDb is notorious for just having stuff that just isn't true or has no sources whatsoever. There's one weird thing that I really liked is the fact that they used two different parrots for the film. One that was just good at flying, so there's these sequences here around the kitchen, the flooded kitchen sequence, and the one that could sit on LL Cool J's shoulder and obviously enjoy cream, like this. Neither could actually talk, another favorite fact of mine, but they're both provided by classic voice actors, Frank Welker, who's done everything from Scooby-Doo back in the 60s all the way up to Futurama, and South Park's Mary Kay Bergman, R.I.P. Mary Kay Bergman. Rennie Harlan had stated during production of the movie that he was determined to make the film under the most controlled circumstances possible, stating that the difficulties of shooting on the high seas for Cutthroat Island had shaken him as a director. Uh, looking at this sequence here that I was just talking about in regards to Samuel L. Jackson, I don't know. I don't actually believe you, Rennie. However, in 2009, more than a decade after the film had been released, Rennie Harlan did state that Deep Blue Sea was actually the hardest film he'd ever had to make. While Rennie Harlan has had his ups and downs in Hollywood over the last 40 years, originally a Finnish-born filmmaker starting out making commercials for Shell, he learned very, very quickly how to tell a story in 15, 30, 60 seconds. Very, very much the David Fincher of Finland. He was in his early 20s and was hired to work for Finnish TV shows such as, uh, but I'm not gonna, even as a, Finnish born son, I'm not going to pronounce this, I'm just going to put this up here, that's a picker, uh, before trying to apply for financing from the Finnish Film Foundation. However, despite sending in several screenplays, they told him his ideas were way too commercial, and that's when Rennie gave up and decided to set his sights on Hollywood. Rennie Harlan then began to work with a friend of his as a Finnish film distributor while working as a director on the side for a few other projects. He was constantly trying to pitch these big action movies with big action stars like Chuck Norris. Uh, the first one was actually called Born American, uh, which Chuck Norris agreed to do. Chuck's main stipulation was that basically if they sent him money that he would do it. Rennie and his friend put together a few hundred thousand dollars and sent Chuck Norris the money and it was literally every single dollar that they had had since they started working in Los Angeles. Then unfortunately Born American fell apart and they tried to use Chuck to help sell the film and Chuck didn't want to do it and but eventually they couldn't get Chuck Norris but they did work with his eldest son Mike Norris. Born American was released in 1982 and became the most expensive Finnish film ever made to date, with a budget of 2.8 million pounds or about $4 million Australian. I'm not converting it to US, you do that yourselves. The film opened in a thousand theatres in the US and ended up growing 3.3 .3 million or 4.7 million Australian. I just told you, you do your own conversion rate. Not to be dismayed, Arlen had set up shop in Los Angeles and was taken under the wing of movie producer Owen Yelblans, the man who had discovered the incredible talent that was John Carpenter and would years later produced Harlan's first US movie, Prison, a low budget horror action film about an innocent inmate who returns from the dead to enact revenge on the officers who sent him to the chair. Trying his hardest, Prison failed to open doors. Harlan would take his own reels with him and travel from city to city, taking bus to bus, and show up with his movies trying to get another gig as director. Eventually, Harlan got to work 
on great Hollywood sequels such as Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and Die Hard 2 Die Harder before unfortunately dealing with one of the greatest bombs in US film history, Cutthroat Island. A movie so bad that it ruined the pirate genre for nearly a decade and became an even bigger joke than another water bomb, Waterworld. Harlan had turned down the highly successful Speed, which came out in 1994, and a James Bond reboot, GoldenEye, to work on Cutthroat Island, and he was devastated by what had happened. Not to mention that 1995 was just a pretty rough place to be in in America, and oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, I was talking about the films, but I, I, yeah, okay, anyway. However, Harlan did eventually bounce back with the incredibly subversive and the absolutely brilliant Long Kiss Goodnight, one of the smartest scripts that Shane Black has ever written, and starred Harlan's wife at the time, the gorgeously tall and astoundingly talented Gina Davis. The film was unfortunately a flop, but Harlan was down but not out. The film did pretty great on VHS, and early DVD sales were pretty positive. To make matters worse, unfortunately, Davis did file for divorce with Rennie Harlan on August 26, 1997, a day after his personal assistant gave birth to a child that Harlan had fathered. Not to be deterred, as 1998 rolled around, a spec script that had been floating around for just over four years finally made it to Rennie Harlan's desk. Now with seven names on the draft, Harlan decided that after the middling success that was Long Kiss Goodnight, this was the film that he would tackle. And then he divorced Gina Davis in June of 1998 and finalized that. Anyway, I do have to say, even though the film is terrifying and runs for just over 100 minutes, less than eight minutes of that film actually feature sharks on screen. Like, fully you can see sharks. Not just like, oh, they're in the background and here's a fin there, but like actual sharks on screen. Which honestly, I think speaks to a great use of filmmaking and cinematography to help tease out the threat. Which, look, I will be honest, Harlan is not the first to do this. A lot of stuff in Jaws, we already covered that. Harlan definitely definitely learned his lessons from his previous films, especially in regards to horror and about the importance of showing terror as something that's far away but really could just sneak up on you. Deep Blue Sea is often touted as one of the greatest shark movies of all time. In fact, back in 2012, Pop Matters ranked the film third behind Jaws and Open Water. And look, Open Water is fine for its initial watch, but honestly, other than a little bit of nudity for some reason, uh, it can get really boring real quick and it doesn't have the body count or the excitement or the great characterization that Deep Blue Sea has. You can watch Deep Blue Sea again and again and again and again and it's frankly a perfect B movie. And I mean that in the kindest way possible. And look, we will eventually talk about the failed single. Uh, I am sure, I, and you've already heard the instrumental being played a whole bunch, uh, we will talk about Diva's Bluest My Hat It's Like a Shark's Fin by LL Cool J, because it's an insane music video, and I think it also may have actually killed song tie-ins for films, but again, we'll talk about that later on. Let's actually talk about the film itself. Is Deep Blue Sea a good film? Is it great on a technical level? Is it great on a writing level? Is it just a great film to watch? Let's look at the story, let's look at the pros and cons, and let's talk about Deep Blue Sea. Let's get deep on Deep Blue Sea. For those who have never seen Deep Blue Sea... Oh wait! How freaking good is it? I remember the thing with the thing- Ah oh, man, fuck! Oh, no, no, okay, well, we'll, uh, for those who have actually never seen it, the story is this, Dr. Susan McAllister producing a protein complex to help people with Alzheimer's by experimenting on Mako sharks. To help with the funding, she enlists the help of Russell Franklin, Samuel L. Jackson obviously, a corporate executive who recently survived an avalanche. Upon arrival at Aquatica, the incredible the laboratory that McAllister helped build, Franklin meets the rest of the crew, Dr. Jim Whitlock, his wife, marine biologist Janie Higgins, shark wrangler Carter Blake, and engineer Tom Scoggins. To round out the cast is tower operator Brenda and chef, the highly religious Sherman Dudley, aka Preacher. As Franklin is shown the facility, nicknamed Aquatica, because, you know, it's on water, things go from great to awful to fucking terrible as the sharks are shown to be smarter than the average bear, or rather the average human. As the research of the facility becomes decimated, the sharks enter Aquatica and pick the humans off one by one in more and more extraordinary fashions, we begin to see the hell that McAllister and her team have wrought. I'm not going to go through the whole movie plot by plot, minute by minute, but I do have to say that this may be one of my favourite horror action films of all time. There's very, very few, but up there with The Thing, or the likes of Ready or Not. It also may be my favourite shark film to watch whenever. Sure, Jaws is a classic, we've already been through this, but Jaws is more or less about humans and family rather than sharks. But seriously, the first time I showed this to my partner, I knew that I, I was revisiting a classic to me, at the very, very least. Overall, I think the film lets itself down a few places, namely the characters are fairly underwritten, and central plot elements could have been 
written a little bit better, such as this monologue from Thomas Jane. Dumb old Carter. Wouldn't understand. Some of the logic doesn't hold up between the shark attacks and why they're attacking. I actually uh, looked up um, whether or not uh, sharks can tell the difference between red wine and blood. Um, yeah, yeah, they do. The shark would be able to smell the difference between wine and blood. It wouldn't get confused by that. They absolutely, they have incredibly highly developed evolutionary noses. They know exactly the difference between the two. Anyway, I also have to say that the ending of this is a bit of a letdown. And it does actually copy the ending from Jaws and its sequels. For those who don't know, the ending to Jaws 3D, which is a real film, sadly, is almost exactly the same as this and the original Jaws for that matter. I do however like the fact that the ending originally had McAllister, Saffron Burrows, escaping the shark at the end and then using Carter's spear gun in it. But apparently uh, during a test screening, audiences literally booed at this ending. They didn't like the fact that Susan got off with a bit of a uh, slap on the wrist and a few cuts. The team went back into the editing room and re-edited the sequence so that Susan would now be killed and eaten and now Preacher killing the shark in one final moment with him and Carter. Preacher was a standout favorite amongst the crowd. And honestly, I feel like the original ending was largely written around what was essentially a larger subplot between Carter and Susan being lovers or at least having a history. Carter was suffering from a case of the not gaze as Riddle and Amelia used to put it. And I, I feel like maybe this doesn't really need to be in the film. The film was actually trimmed down a lot in the edit. Anybody who has the Blu-ray copy, seen here, uh, a lot of scenes that were taken out were largely focused on the dynamic of the characters and what their relationships were with one another. When the studio saw the first act in the Sea Lab didn't take place until about 40 minutes into the movie, let alone the sharks being seen and attacking everyone, the filmmakers trimmed down so the first attack sequence happens almost exactly at the 30 minute mark. Here is the time code here. I will say that while I appreciate some of the deleted scenes, especially seeing more of Preacher and Brent together. LL Cool J and Ada Totoro really play off each other very well and now that I think about it, Brenda is only in like three scenes. They establish her as the radio tower lady, they have her at the dinner here which she's in like four or five seconds, she barely has any dialogue, and then she dies. And that's, that's really it. Um, Kind of, kind of sucks, to be honest. We get as much of their backstories in these small moments as they escape from Aquatica, but I do think that, and I wouldn't recut the film, I, I think the film's pretty great as it is, but they're missing out on all of these relationships and dynamics. In fact, a lot of the critics had the exact same problems that I did. You know, his, his father died when he went home at Christmas. He said he didn't tell you because he knew it would distract you, but I know he didn't tell you because he didn't. He knew it wouldn't distract you at all. I will say there are a lot of pros and cons. Well, we'll go through the pros really quickly. The movie moves at a breakneck pace. The editing is tight as a fucking drum, and so much of it is always there to just establish the size and threat of these sharks, and I really appreciate that. Yes, the dynamics are a little bit off with the relationships and the characters, but the relationship between humans and sharks cannot be understated from the first 10 to 15 minutes of the film. The film also works in, from a structural standpoint. From a screenwriting standpoint, it's a little bit chunky in areas, but as a simple three-act structure, Structure, and I'm a structured guy, really, really appreciate that a whole bunch, and especially considering how tight the runtime is. They don't try to make every character likable, which I think was such against what 90 screenwriting rules had, especially coming off the back of films like Armageddon and Independence Day. While Deep Blue Sea isn't exactly a disaster movie, it does have elements and qualities of it, but one thing that it definitely leaves out compared to something like Independence Day and Armageddon, where every character has to be pretty much likable or relatable to some degree, I do like the fact that Susan McAllister is not a hero in this story. She is more more of a tragic Greek character who is blinded by her ambition and will just literally push everything out of the way to make sure it comes to fruition. And unfortunately, that leads to her demise. The sharks are largely practical when they need to be. The CGI has always been the bane of sharks and shark movies, as we've seen, God, from countless films from Sharknado and Megalodon and all of their sequels. I understand why they do CGI creatures. First, sharks are unwieldy creatures and you can't really, you know, train a shark to be exactly perfect on film and having an animatronic shark they've known since the 70s that that's not going to work the electronics and water very very rarely mix they're impossible to direct on screen and sometimes they just break down and i feel as though when the animatronic shark is being used such as these sequences here it's incredible it never looks fake and the presence of it is terrifying however some of the sequences here with the cgi they do try to cover it with a little bit of darkness a little bit of movie magic here and there but ultimately i do think the practical and the more physical sharks do have a better presence on screen than most of the other sequences. Stuff like this and this 
And this all make the stakes higher than ever before and absolutely are unforgettable, brilliant moments. But they use the water to obscure the shark as much as possible, just like they do with the CGI moments. They learned from general horror directing, and as Rennie Harlan has an experience in, that the less you see, the better. And ultimately, you use it for these close-up shots, you use it for these more dangerous sequences. Ultimately, the pros of the film is that they really cared about making sure the sharks terrifying and that the humans are ultimately the villains and create their own demise. I think that that's such a wonderful takeaway from this film is that the worst part of the film is the humans. There, except for the ones in the opening sequence, everybody here is greedy to some degree or have their own flaws and mistakes. The most brilliant man ever. He's pissing into the wind. How brilliant can he be? You'll see. Whether it's apathy from Dr. Whitlock, or it's just his past when it comes to Carter Blake. I think all of them play it so well. The only real downside to any of the characters of the acting here is that, yeah, a lot of stuff was cut out. Even though I'm not a huge fan of actors like Michael Rappaport, I still think he does a great job here being the nerdy, over-the-top, egregious and tortured scientist who's trying to get everybody together despite things going awry. You see how that works? She's screwed with the sharks, and now the sharks are screwing with us. Now, let's get into the cons of the film. I mentioned before, the characters aren't all fully fleshed out, and I do think that while the exposition is tight and short, that there are a few few things where they could have totally made uh, Franklin's character a little bit more demanding and a little bit more serious about his investment. I feel like maybe because it's Samuel L. Jackson, he's just so fucking cool, he's a little bit too laid back to actually feel as though he's an executive. Yeah, he's wearing a sweater, yeah, he's got a lot of money, but at the end of the day, I would love for him to be just as ruthless as Susan McAllister, just so they could just kind of brush up against one another. There is so much stuff that is originally cut from the shooting script, but they also brush over the fact that a lot of the characters really have only like four or five lines to establish who they are and what they want, which is totally fine. That's great screenwriting and to some degree, but it, the fact that it never really comes to fruition, they're pretty much the exact same characters they are in the first act as they are in the third, except for maybe they become shark food. In fact, the only two fully fleshed out characters are our protagonist, Susan McAllister, and Russell Franklin. And Russell Franklin gets his time to shine, obviously, in the most iconic sequence in the entire film, which we all know and we've all been expecting this coming here. <laughs> Samuel L. Jackson getting eaten by a shark has been so incredible and iconic that it's been memed, it's been turned into all sorts of gifs, and the scene itself already has millions of views on YouTube. Deep blue sea, they ate me! A f shark ate me! Great bitch! Samuel Jackson, it's my beer! But I do have to say that Russell Franklin, while not the antagonist of the film, I do think is very well written. The whole monologue about the avalanche is pretty incredible and talks to the nature of humans versus nature, the main theme of the film. The fact that there's way too many things that are taken from Jaws is also a bit of a negative. Like this license plate, which is kind of cute to some degree, and this jump scare, which is taken directly from the death of Ben in Jaws. Like it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. And also, like I mentioned before, the ending, which look is, it's going to be hard to top Jaws and especially how that film ends, which is so incredible. And especially when they cut to, to, to Roy Schneider here and his relief and God, what a great movie. Anyway, there's no reason to imitate it. There are so many other ways they could have blown up and destroyed the shark. The finale is also a bit of a letdown, at least from a thematic level. Carter and Chef don't really have that big a personal gripe against the shark itself. They really are, to some degree, secondary characters. Carter is a shark wrangler and he's very, very good at his job. And Chef, while yes, the shark did eat his bird, eat my bird, he doesn't really tie into the greater themes of the film. And that's why I think Susan McAllister should have been the one that destroyed it. But I guess that's the thing, is that her death really, really works. The fact that she pays the price for her ultimate demise and the demise of her teammates is pretty good. I will give it that. I do think it's a letdown, mainly because we've seen this kind of thing so many times before. And the fact that Susan dies, I guess it's original that a woman dies? I don't think that's... Well, it's a con. It's not a pro. Also, finally, the powers of the sharks are deeply uncertain. I do get that they're smart and they're strong and they're sharks and you know they have home ground advantage with the water but they never explain why x amount of shark equals y amount of force. It totally makes sense with the biting and some of the cages and stuff like that but there are some moments like this with the can they break glass? I guess glass is not as sharp and I guess we established the glass breaking before but that they kind of threw a dude at the glass so maybe like how thick is the glass? There needs to be certain things that are established. I know that the thickness of the glass is established in this scene where they show Skarsgård 
and he breaks it and stuff like that. But I look, if you're watching this with a marine biologist, I feel like they would just get up and leave within the first 20 minutes. Anyway, that's all the cons. Really, they're more nitpicks than anything else. But I do want to actually talk about the greatest death in this movie. And I think... I know I mentioned it before, but hands down, I didn't learn until my 20s that people thought that the reason it's in there is because Samuel L. Jackson hated working on the film, and so he was written out of the film. I remember talking to some nerdy friends at university whenever we talked about Deep Blue Sea. On the contrary, that despite this terrible, grueling shoot, and I actually had looked this up, Jackson spent most of his downtime just playing golf on some of those beautiful links in Mexico. He was actually pretty happy to shoot the film. He enjoyed living for a few months in Baja between the scenes like i said before this was shot on the exact same tank the titanic was shot on and yeah samuel L. jackson pretty much had a good time except for obviously this sequence where he was nearly drowned to death by rennie harlan the fact that jackson had loved working on the long kiss goodnight with rennie harlan and look forward to working with him again is such a wonderful thing to hear but the reality is is that jackson was originally offered the role of preacher obviously the more religious character and was later cast with ll cool j in mind jackson's management didn't like jackson playing the chef or the preacher or the fact that in the original script chef died in the first act of the film and so things eventually changed there were some negotiations and obviously Jackson's character dies basically at the second act turning into the third what's really fascinating about this scene is that it was way longer it was so much longer and speaking with the VFX site befores and afters visual effects supervisor Jeff Okun spoke about Deep Blue Sea and that death scene specifically Okun stated originally when he got the script it was seven pages of the worst dialogue you've ever heard on set Sam was being directed to read the full seven pages before Rennie Harlan stepped in and told Sam Sam Jackson to pace himself, to focus just on the story beats and what he was saying about the avalanche. To which Jackson asked Rennie, Rennie, have you read this dialogue? I don't want to say it. After 20 takes of the monologue, Jeff Okun stepped in with his VFX team and obviously as the supervisor, stated how much more effective the scene would be if Sam was just attacked before he even gets to say his big speech. Out of the total seven pages, Jackson only says about a page and a half. After trying to negotiate between Rennie and Sam, the scene was shot and Okun spoke with Sam Jackson who he'd built the relationship up with many other films like Sphere and Long Kiss Goodnight, Okun was the visual effects supervisor on those films too. Okun states the conversation was quite simple. Sam, you know we can kill you even before you're at the end of the pool if you're happy. And he goes, yeah, I'm not happy. Just kill me. The sooner you kill me, the happier I'll be. And the scene went ahead as planned and was eventually screened and came back with dozens of notes from the studio. One of them being that the film needed to be recut and turned from a horror film into a campy thriller that just happened to have sharks. Three-time Oscar nominee, Frank Or it was then brought in to re-edit the film. You'd know his name from films like Tombstone and Die Hard and Robocop, really strong action-oriented films. Frank and Jeff O'Kun started talking about editing the famous scene and asked a simple question with the extra takes. How fast can you kill him and what can you do with the shark? The answer turned out really, really fast when talking with the visual effects team at Hammerhead Productions. That is, frankly, one of the best visual effects teams you could name for a shark film. The film was then re-edited with the visual effects team with a new version of the the death scene for the cast and the crew. Stam called up Jeff O'Kun and had three simple words for him. Best death ever. Jackson has stated on the record that it is his favorite death of any movie he's been in. And there's been a lot of great Stam Jackson deaths. I, I like Ultimately, there are really only a few things that are genuinely disappointing about this film, and honestly, it comes down to just a few things. The CGI, some of the acting and the writing, and the tone of the film is frankly all over the place. What is an extremely fun B-movie creature feature with elements of horror and action is often played so straight that if it weren't for the likes of LL Cool J, some of the rewrites, and a little bit of Brenda, I think this film would have turned into a bigger mess, and would have frankly been almost unwatchable. So yeah, the film is largely flawed, but I really love it. Is it the best shark movie of all time? No, but it ranks up there. Is it the best movie of 1999? No, but it ranks up there. Is it the best creature feature ever? It's pretty up there. Is it a fun little insane film that's chaotic and makes almost no sense and is just a ridiculously intense ride from beginning to end? Yes. Yes, it absolutely is. Now, with all of that out of the way, my general review for Deep Blue Sea, we have to talk about the most insane thing about this movie. Now, I'm 33. I just turned 33, actually. I'm very, very white, and I absolutely love late 90s and early 2000s hip-hop and music in general. One of my favorite rappers was LL Cool J, simply because I could say, Mama said knock you out, I'm gonna knock you out without worrying my parents or cussing. One of my favorite weird cultural phenomenons that the 90s started and then, frankly, left there was the fact that most movies had a single or a song tied to it. In the late 90s, this was the glory days of those singles. You could have a huge hit of a film and a huge 
number one single on the Billboard charts. You had Don't Wanna Miss a Thing with Armageddon. You had My Heart Will Go On with Titanic, a blockbuster song with a blockbuster movie. You had Come With Me For God's... Oh, okay. Well, this was written before. Let's not talk about that. And of course, you had The King, who was Will Smith. After Men in Black, every single damn studio had to have a single to be a cultural force to be reckoned with. You had Wild Wild West in 1998, and in 1999, you really couldn't have a bigger hit. The biggest hit I could find from that year that was based on a soundtrack was weirdly a TV soundtrack, Kiss Me by Sixpence, None the Richer, a one-hit wonder on the Dawson's Creek soundtrack, a song that I really like and have very slowly learned to play. It reached number six on the Billboard charts at the year-end hottest 100 singles for 1999, and the biggest musical film of that year was the Oscar-nominated South Park Bigger, Longer and Uncut, with some incredibly, truly memorable songs from that. I listen to the soundtrack often, still gives me a chuckle. I was going to mention the likes of Beautiful Stranger by Madonna because I really love that song, but apparently that never made it higher than 19 and only got her a stupid Grammy. And then there was the incredible crossover pop hit Steal My Sunshine by Len on the Ghost soundtrack, which wasn't written for the Ghost soundtrack, but I love it anyway. It also only peaked at number 9 on the summer of 1999. Deep Blue Sea was primed more than ever to have a number one hit song to go with their number two blockbuster. But as I was saying, LL Cool J was a really cool dude for a nine year old kid. And I remember after watching Deep Blue Sea, this coming on video hits the weekend after and being simply baffled. First and foremost, let's just talk about the fact about this music video. It, it is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And the fact that they were trying to chase a trend is totally fine. Everybody was doing it at the time, but I really want to point out the fact that this isn't an isolated incident. Like I mentioned previously, there is just dozens of examples of this. This was the hot thing to do and you could possibly win a Grammy for it if you were good enough or even an Oscar. The music video is over the top. It is just insane. There's also a reason they don't film most rap or hip hop videos underwater. I, I can only think of like maybe three or four music videos that have a water or an underwater element, specifically this Missy Elliott music video. Anyway, the second thing is that Rennie Harlan directed this music video, and I took a quick look at the internet music video database, which I check often because I love it. It's the first music video Rennie Harlan ever directed. Thirdly, and finally, this was a case up until 2019, so I did, I did check, I did check properly. Rennie Harlan has a Facebook page, and he uploads things to his Facebook page often, and I couldn't really find anything else about it, but he did direct a music video by MC Jin, and it's just MC Jin. I think some of the actors are from the movie singing along, and I, I don't know, this just feels like really early 2000s, it feels like it could have been a music video for one of the Fast and the Furious films, like I could feel like there's a horrible part of me that feels like I could shoot a music video better than this, and I'm not just, like I haven't edited this, I haven't messed around with this because I needed to get around copyright, this is just what it looks like. Yeah, Rennie Holland has only directed one music video, and I guess he really, really loves this music video enough to post it to his Facebook page. Again, I'm not 100% sure he directed this, but it feels weird that he would share it just as like a promo for a film that he did. It's weird that he is a great director, and he's only ever directed one music video. A lot of great directors cut their teeth on music videos, and yet somehow, <sighs> that music video looks like this. Deepest Bluest by LL Cool J. Now, the whole conceit of the song is, I guess, the movie, which I'm frankly not going to go into, like, that deep. Because if you look at the lyrics for something like Men in Black, or On Our Own by Bobby Brown, which was part of the Ghostbusters 2 soundtrack, or Wild Wild West, or a few of the other examples that I gave prior, there's not a lot that goes really into a movie tie-in single. But I think that LL Cool J really did think about what Deepest Bluest means to him, and apparently it's about the hat. Because sometimes LL Cool J wears a hat. He still wears hats. In fact, a lot of the time during the 90s, he wore a hat a lot. Uh, it looks like this. What is the deal with you wearing hats? I'm bald. Running around with this freezing bald head. I can't take it, son. I'm all, when I'm Sam Hand on NCIS, they got me bald head running around. That's cool, but I need to wear my hat when I'm so, relaxing. I feel, you... more, I feel more luxurious and all that. It's like... And sometimes the hat is like a shark's fin. Deepest, bluest... The hat is like a shark's fin. His hat is like a shark's fin. And I think that it's implying that he's also a shark. So I guess he's one of the villains of Deep Blue Sea. It's very, very confusing because Men in Black, the song Men in Black is about the movie Men in Black and specifically that Will Smith plays a man who's a Men in Black and how they're like secret. And Wild Wild West, 
is about Jim West, Desperado, and I th- I think LL Cool J... Somebody didn't stop LL Cool J. I think that's what happened here. I looked up the song on Genius, because also I do that a lot, because I'm very, very white, and I was like, oh, it can't be that shallow. It can't just be like, I, he's like a shark. LL Cool J is like a shark, and his hat is like a shark's fin. But it is. That is literally what this song is about. There's some really great lines in here about being a shark or like representations of the shark that LL Cool J is trying to metaphorically harness. Like predator created by a needle. Jet black eyes, baby, they stare while you sleep. With no Titanic. This kind of stuff, yeah. Sharks are kind of like that. They're created by a needle part. That's a part of the plot. Damn, nothing left with a right hand. Clinging to a rail, escape, protect, fail. You never make it home. I, I guess, I guess. The shark does eat Dr. Whitlock's right hand. That's also a part of the film. And who can forget classic lines like, your blood is so warm, your life vest is off, and that turns me on. Killer for- Which, I guess, it, Saffron Burrows does take off a life jacket. I mean, I guess it's not really a life jacket. But I gotta save my favorite line for the breakdown. I really, we really need to talk about this music video. The song itself is fine. I have no problem with the song. It's, it's in a heavy rotation with a whole bunch of other music soundtracks that I listen to when I write and I put these things together. Because nostalgia is a hell of a drug. But I really need to talk about the music video. The music video is essentially about Deep Blue Sea. And I, I, I really, I really love this whole era of music videos. This is obviously when I grew up. This is how I got into some of my favorite directors of all time. Chris Cunningham, Michelle Gondry, Spike Jones, David Fincher, all great music video directors and subsequently amazing directors in their own right. I thought it was amazing that you could synthesize something that is both emotional and visually insane into three to four minute pieces. And I have to say that that insanity is on full display here in the deepest bluest music video. I'm so glad I can use clips for this because obviously I can't really use the music that much because of copyright, but I, I, I think that we need to take into account that these songs based on movies or these singles tied into movies, their whole point was to sell the movie. And it feels like because they shot this film in 1998 and because the music video probably was shot around the same time, or at least early 1999, one of the biggest hits at the time was, unfortunately, this. Now, when I wrote this script, nothing had really come out about P. Diddy. There were allegations, sure. But literally, when I started to record voiceover for this was literally the day his house was fucking raided. And I unfortunately have to use examples, and I'm really, really sorry, but history sometimes does that to you. It fucks you over, and then you have to learn from it. Now, I think that Deepest Bluest has certain elements which are very, very similar to the P. Diddy Jimmy Page song, Come With Me, which largely is built on a Led Zeppelin sample. Although, not really, because you've got Jimmy Page here and there's some John Bonham drums, and I just feel as though when they were putting together Deepest Bluest, which I imagine was written for the film, since LL Cool J is in the film, the song doesn't really have, like, strong orchestral elements. But the video does. There's a whole orchestra here in black for some reason, and I guess they're trying to look like sharks. I think Rennie saw Come With Me, he saw the music video, and even though Cashmere, which is the sample that Come With Me is based on, and I feel like he saw that and he was like, we gotta get an orchestra. Like, how much does it cost to rent an orchestra, and do orchestras naturally fear water? They don't? Great, let's just do this. And I I feel like that's what happened. I feel like Come With Me, in a sense, is responsible for Deepest Bluest. Because they added this orchestral version in Come With Me, and it's a big part of the song. It's I really love the song. I was obsessed with this movie movie and this song and this whole album. I, I, I'm not going to go into more memories and stuff, but I had the Godzilla hand when I was a kid because that was really cool. I just want to make a point about the fact that Come With Me had an odd legacy on this film, and I will say that the weirdest and worst part of it was in Deepest Bluest, this orchestral part, this, this, this kind of use of strings, it's really just like a two or three second sample. In fact, I literally went through and I separated the instrumental. This is just all it is. It's just this throughout the entire song. Like, I get having an orchestra there, but this feels like it was like whatever door they were using, or even if they just brought in maybe two violinists or maybe a person with a cello there's barely any orchestra it's it's not an orchestra it's just a sample at least with something like come with me the cashmere sample sounds like it was re-recorded and then re-edited to be added into the song come with me 
in Deepest Bluest, it would be hard to argue that there was an orchestra that was a part of this track. I'm sorry. And I looked it up on Discogs, and yeah, there's no conductor, there's no real person credited for the orchestral side of this song, so it doesn't make sense for it to be in the music video. That's the influence that Come To Me had on Rennie Harlan and the visual aesthetic of this music video. And I, 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 I feel like, from a music video perspective, it's just confusing. It's just weird. And, and there are some other elements to this. Like, I, I do have to give some credit to LL Cool J because he really put his heart and soul into this. You can see he does almost the exact same level of acting and performance in this music video as he does in the movie Deep Blue Sea, and I respect that a whole bunch. There's also a bunch of other weird elements where there's these synchronized swimmers, and he's I guess they're trying to be sexy? I just can't remember any other LL Cool J music videos or, or anything in his discography that was about swimming or getting wet or like just women in bathing suits in general. And so I guess, you know, he tried. He tried to make synchronized swimming sexy. He didn't get it to work, but he did try. I also I realized when I was putting this together, when I was starting to edit this, the only way this music video could be actually cool is if LL Cool J turned into a shark by the end. That would, if, if I was Rennie Harlan, I would have paid my visual effects team an extra 100K to make that happen. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out like, what the budget for this music video was because this was the time when music video budgets were in the millions yes they're they're still very very expensive now if you're a big pop artist like say Taylor Swift or Sabrina Carpenter or uh, Olivia Rodrigo but this was in the era where those types of budgets were not the norm and I'm also trying to figure out if they filmed this on the Aquatica set or if they had it separately built because you can only see from certain angles that this doesn't look like a big part of the set and if it is it looks like it's kind of mashed together with a few other things that kind of makes it look like it's the main dunk tank where Samuel L. Jackson gets attacked. I feel like Warner Brothers would have wanted to save some money and shoot it on one of the spare sound stages that they'd already set up for like a different movie but then they were like well I guess you know we are trying to make this a number one single we don't really have a hit single right now let's just do this. And then Austin Powers came out and Beautiful Stranger was a huge hit for them and that was a Warner Brothers thing. Anyway, the point is, I think LL Cool J really worked with Rennie Harlan to make this work. Visually, it's fascinating. I think that it's almost as intense or tries to be as intense as the movie. And I think they really try to make that work. And I just, I feel like there's a few things in here and I, I really do like the fact that LL Cool J is, um, they keep showing him getting sprayed with water and, and, he, and I just... <laughs> Just a part of me that just feels like his rapping just sounds like this, like <laughs> what he's trying to rap. I do have to say, if you've never seen the movie before and like this just came on like video hits or Rage or MTV or whatever, you would be so confused. And then also, again, because these songs were trying to sell the movie, there's just so many spoilers in it and so many deaths. Like, I, I mean, I guess, you know, when oh, My Heart Will Go On came out, you kind of knew that the ship was going to sink, but I guess that there was like a historical thing. You didn't know if one of them was going to survive or not. And I, I feel like there's a few other things here where he's like, is he, is he trying to do like a Jesus Christ thing here? Is that like a thing? Like I, uh, I just feel like it's so confusing what he wants to do with this. And I guess he's trying to be like a shark. I mean, I guess that explains the water and stuff like that. And then the line here, the ocean is haunted. And I'm just like, when I think about that, I think about that tweet about the moon being haunted, but I just like replaces like the ocean's haunted. I'm like what? Ocean's haunted, get a gun. And I just, I wish there was more like that. I wish he fought a shark in this music video. I think they're trying to make it like, hey, when people are wet, it's hot. And I, I get that. And I get that with the whole synchronized swimming thing. But when it's fucking freezing or when there's like a shark, that's not hot. That's nothing. There's nothing sexy about being a shark. And I know that there's sexy sharks out there. I've seen DeviantArt. I've seen Rule 34. There's sexy sharks. I totally get that. I don't want to fuck a shark, but I know that there's sexy sharks out there. But this was like pre-sexy anthropomorphic sharks. I think that that kind of gate opened when there was like left shark and everyone wanted to fuck them. That was what that meme was about? The fact that everybody wanted to fuck that shark, right? That was the whole thing? And there's also like a lot of shark footage, which I think is fine because it's a music video. And then also, I, I just, I, mean, I know we're kind of skimming through this music video but also why is he so huge compared to everyone else like why is he so big and oh my god oh my god um wow he did wow Rennie Harlan did give those people a hundred thousand dollars he did turn to a shark at the end wow he really wow he just he did that they did that they did that in this music video. How does no one just talk about this music video constantly? I know we're doing this because of Deep Blue Sea but how does no one just talk about the fact that this music video exists 
and like the fact that there's not like five million like just please for the love of god i know i've just skimmed through this but just for, for my sake and say for the sake of ll cool jam warner brothers just go watch this whole music video on youtube let's get let's get these view counts up i know none of my videos have like over uh 10 000 views but let's get this into the five millions what do we say what do we say chat and it's cute that they shot like a little outro i like that i like that Rennie harlan kind of wanted to put a little little button on there that was that was kind of nice anyway i think um I think Deepest Bluest uh, might be the greatest music video of 1999. And we've got some hot contenders here. You can see my tier list with a few other great music videos that came out that year. There's Weapon of Choice, Beautiful Stranger, there's like a lot here. And I think, yeah, we're going to put Deepest Bluest in the S tier. Yep. Okay. That's great. One of the great. Oh, it's sorry. I Sorry. This isn't the best uh, music videos of, of 1999. Uh, this is the best music videos of all time. Wow. Okay. What a, what, a, what a wonderful list. I thought I thought everyone forgot about this music video and this song. And I found out like two years ago, this guy made a new metal version of this song and it fucking rules and this sounds like if deep blue sea came out in 2002 instead of 1999 this would have torn through the charts if this was by corn and they like did their own version of like deepest bluest yeah, like that kind of thing this would have been great ll cool j would have still been featured on there as like a guest verse it's just kind of, it, honestly it's just this whole song the this music video in fact the whole soundtrack i downloaded the entire soundtrack and i was listening to it while i was editing the whole soundtrack is crazy because it's all pretty much hip-hop i don't know what any of these songs have to do with sharp there's two ll cool j songs on them and say what just sounds like a song about what it's like to be a gangster not necessarily a shark unless it's about a shark gangster and how important it is to stick to those values the gangster values not the shark values and most of the tracks that are actually on this album because i checked discogs i literally can't find on youtube i if you look up the soundtrack you can find trevor rabin's absolutely beautiful terrifying original score that is on there that is fantastic i really really love that it's still haunting it's such a great soundtrack where it's trying to interpolate some of what made the original john williams jaw theme scary but kind of amps it up to to an nth degree the, the this original soundtrack not the original score but the original soundtrack it was so hard to find i was looking up the song smoke man by smoke man and i could only find the fucking instrumental in fact this guy deaf cool guy 27 has specifically made instrumentals of nearly every single track on this album which is just weird right like I, I know i mentioned before my favorite thing is to do deep dives on these things pardon the pun but i i just think it's incredible that this one guy just did this anyway deepest bluest is a great song it's not amazing it's not perfect but it's definitely memorable it's definitely fantastic during the many months of me putting this together like I, I started this script a long time ago and i was really trying to put this whole thing together and i knew deepest bluest would be the crux of my review it would be it would be at least the way that i would finish up the first section of this review and i feel as though deepest bluest it might have just come out a little bit too late looking at what the future of single tie-in tracks look like i'm not saying deepest bluest killed that trend that can be attributed to faith hill and the track that she provided to pearl harbor and possibly nod your head black suits coming by will smith and i feel like even though it only lasted about six to seven years I miss this. I wish there was a hit single that tied into Dune or say something like like another big action film that's coming out this year, Twisters. The original Twister had the song Human Being by Van Halen. I would love if say, God, I don't know, Limp Bizkit get, came out of the woodwork and they released a track that was tied into the Twisters film. That would be amazing. But only a man can dream. I have to be honest, the music video for Deepest Bluest isn't any more ridiculous than Wild Wild West or Nod Your Head or more serious stuff like Lose Yourself or My Heart Will Go On. It's great to see that LL Cool J wanted to take on Will Smith and look, he wasn't successful, but I still think he filled the parameters. He was able to sell the film, he was able to tie it into the movie, and he was able to do what is essentially a fantastic role as a performer and as an actor. Deepest Bluest never charted, but the soundtrack did pop on the top R&B and hip hop albums at number 55 on the billboard 100 and then it quickly fell off and ll cool j kind of didn't really recover after the 2000s uh, i mean ll cool j has continued to act and obviously he's he was releasing albums up until a decade ago his last album came out in 2013 he got two grammys he's got two music video awards including a lifetime achievement award which is amazing oh and he won a blockbuster entertainment award in 2000 when blockbuster was a thing for playing preacher which i i for some reason i have footage of that I just, again, again, I do deep dives on these things. I don't, I don't mess around. Okay, I really love this film. I really love this song. I really love the score. I really love so much about this film. And I, unfortunately, before I go into these sequels, I have to give my final verdict on what I feel about Deep Blue Sea. In 1999, I was a young cinephile. 
and I know we've kind of already talked about this a lot, but I feel like Deep Blue Sea, in a way, got me into horror films, or horror-adjacent films to some degree. I wasn't a big horror fan. My older sister was. She knew about Jason, Freddy, Chucky. She knew every single character, and she was just enamored with this film as much as I was. But for different reasons. She was a little bit older than I was, and she got the scares, and she got the kind of creature feature nature of it, while I was kind of just enjoying it as a dumb action film with my family. When this movie came out in 1999, sharks weren't hugely popular, but the early 2000s was a renaissance for shark and shark-related movies, with the likes of Open Water and obviously the very family-friendly shark tale, and obviously to some degree Finding Nemo, where sharks were back in fashion. Things kind of didn't come back to Deep Blue Sea for a very long time, and obviously we'll get into that, but even Rennie Harlan moved on to a Stallone vehicle called Driven, which is a whole other story how much of a mess of a production that is, and it seemed that the world would just forget about Deep Blue Sea. The world would move on, and that would be the end of Deep Blue Sea, essentially. Samuel L. Jackson continued to be a megastar, and I'll keep watching his films until I die. He eventually entered the MCU and became one of the most iconic characters in cartoon, comic, and film history. Thomas Jane became the Punisher, and he technically just wants his kids back according to Arrested Development. I just want my kids back. Saffron Burrows, uh, she has an insane career, as all things considered. If you want to look up a eclectic and fascinating career, look up Saffron Burrows on IMDb. She was in Troy, which apparently a lot of people love. She was nominated for a bunch of SAG awards because she was in Boston Legal. Totally forgot about Boston Legal. And good for her. I mean, Deep Blue Sea, it's a great film. It's a fun film. It's far from a perfect movie. Would I rate it four out of five stars today on my letterbox if I could? Yeah, absolutely. Its logic doesn't really work. It's science doesn't really work, there's a lot of things about sharks I'm pretty sure is false, but its setups, set pieces, and structure make for an absolutely thrilling ride that I would recommend to, I would say, almost anybody over the age of 12, let alone 8. I love this movie, but I know most people find it either excessive or stupid or chaotic in my partner's case, and she is 100% correct. I cannot deny that. And not because she's my partner, but because she is exactly right about Deep Blue Sea. It's a crazy chaotic fun film that, to me, only gets better as I get older. I've watched this movie almost every single year since I was eight, but sometimes you do grow up, you get better taste, but deep down, you still have a few favorites. They're not guilty pleasures, they're just favorites. And just like me in my teens, by the mid-2000s, it felt like everybody moved on from Deep Blue Sea. Except for Warner Brothers. How in the hell did Deep Blue Sea 2 even come to be? How did it get into production? Who funded this? Why did this happen? I really do think we need to answer this question because we are in an era of just streaming that doesn't really respect the audience anymore. It looks as though they're just doing things algorithmically, but back in the day, they had one true way of letting people know how stuff would sell. Money. Look, if you want me to hear me to talk about how weird and awful this movie is, you can just skip to that time code, but I really, really want to know how this film was greenlit why it happened, and also what happened. Why did this incredible B-movie that frankly made back a lot of its money get this terrible direct-to-DVD, or rather direct-to-Blu-ray, sequel? Let's dive right in. Well, how did this happen? That is a great question. To give a proper answer, we have to look back to the mid-2000s. Not even the early 2000s, like the mid-2000s. The coolest time to be alive, as you can see from this starter pack. Around 2008, Movie Hole, one of the most reputable film websites ever, reported that Deep Blue Sea 2 was coming direct to DVD. With great insights that none of the cast would be returning, nor the directors, nor any of the writers, nor any of probably the original production team whatsoever. And all it had to do was just be released with the team at Warner Premiere. But what exactly is Warner Premiere? Well, in 2006, at the height of the time of Blu-rays and DVDs, Warner Home Entertainment pulled a Disney and announced a whole new subsidiary called Warner Premiere that would be releasing original direct-to-DVD films, or direct-to-video films, on a consistent basis based on their hottest properties. Mainly films that were well-received theatrically, but wouldn't probably do so if a sequel was made. I imagine there was a lot of market testing and a lot of executives nodding and being like, hmm, we could still make a bunch of money on this if we just skimped out on almost everything that made the original great. The first Warner premiere was the Dukes of Hazard prequel, The Dukes of Hazard: The Beginning, 
based on the classic TV show of the exact same name, which obviously Warner Brothers owns, and the Johnny Knoxville Jessica Simpson vehicle of the exact same name, which frankly, I loved back in 2005. The film was released in March of 2007. The film cost about $5 million and was licensed and edited for a PG-rated version on ABC Family, the ABC subsidiary that's just the worst films you could imagine that don't end up on the Lifetime network. Then, an unrated DVD version was released just a few weeks after that original premiere, and it grossed over $2 million in initial DVD sales within the first 10 weeks. They were making money hand over fist for something that basically didn't have a lot of original input. After the initial success, there were sequels and prequels to Get Smart, The Lost Boys, Ace Ventura, A Cinderella Story, a series that somehow has six entries for some reason, and then there was no Deep Blue Sea 2 news for over a decade. Then, in June 2017, it was announced that filming had begun in Cape Town, South Africa. But what happened to that initial announcement back in 2008? Well, it turns out that they did hire a director, the same guy who helmed Some Guy Who Kills People, Wild Things 2, and Mega Shark vs. Giant Octopus, Jack Perez. Holy shit! Perez was told he was be directing Deep Blue Sea 2, but not told he also had to write it. Jack Perez spoke with Birth Movie's death in 2017, just months after the initial announcement of a new Deep Blue Sea movie beginning production. When asked about the sequel, Perez stated that the script is about the scientific research ship that is seized by Somalian pirates, and a team of Navy SEALs has to go in and take them out. The whole ship is basically a gigantic floating laboratory with mazes of tunnels that sharks can travel through and open up tanks and make things dangerous and deadly. My thinking was that this was like Sergeant Rock versus Sharks, so I developed this platoon kind of based on my favourite Sergeant Rock characters. It was similar to what they did in Predator, there were definitely echoes of that sort of motley group. So basically it was kind of going to be like Predator but with Sharks. Perez was hoping to make it for under 5 million, but the DVD market had dried up by the time Warner Premiere had started to get things into production. Warner Premiere had lost interest in making sequels and ultimately folded in 2013. The WB thought it wasn't physically possible despite the relatively low budget. The sequel was right on the verge of happening, with casting almost underway. Things didn't go Perez's way. Warner Brothers Home Entertainment stepped in with a couple million dollars, a South African tax credit, and a script written by the guy who wrote Radio Rebel and two of those Cinderella story sequels. And then also, the director of House Party 5, Tonight's the Night, would be the one helming Deep Blue Sea 2. Deep Blue Sea 2 was now underway with a teaser poster that definitely doesn't look like an intern at Warner Brothers put it together in Photoshop in about two hours. They dropped their first trailer at the start of 2018 and it racked up millions of views across Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Frankly, it was doing quite well from a marketing standpoint. As of 2022, the Deep Blue Sea 2 trailer has nearly 6 million views from one media. Literally just a trailer farm, but still a pretty good indicator that people kind of cared about it. So it's not too bad for a director video sequel that came out, god, about 19 years a little too late. Then, on April 17th, the world opened its eyes and Deep Blue Sea 2 was injected into them. And uh, the reception was... Well, we'll get to that in a second, but the reception, let's just say already, was not super great. But what is this weird, low-budget, South African sequel and name-only shark movie called Deep Blue Sea 2 actually about? What is Deep Blue Sea 2 actually about? Well, let's get into it. It's basically the same movie as the first one, but with way less charm, way worse acting, a lower budget, weaker effects, and it just... it just sucks so bad. Okay, well, alright, but what, well, let's, okay, I, I'll push my judgment aside for a second. What is Deep Blue Sea 2 actually about? This is Misty Calhoun, which honestly sounds like a poor name from Boogie Nights. She's a shark conservationist and a uni lecturer for some reason, and she has students who get to join her own version of Aquatica. I genuinely can't remember the name of their wet lab. I could literally Google it right now, but I just don't care. Anyway, they meet a dude called Durant, and he's like their Samuel L. Jackson, I guess. And I don't say that because he's going to die later on. It's because he's a pharmaceutical guy, and he has a lot of money, and he looks like a shark to some degree. And anyway, he talks to Misty, and he's like, hey, you need to look at a shark. Can you help my company? And then almost everyone dies, basically. In this knockoff version of Aquatica, a relatively big set. This first main dunk tank is pretty good, but then when the last act of the film happens, it's basically the same hallway set over and over again, but just from different angles, and then they just change the LED lighting on it, like a streamer trying to get views. It feels like I'm watching an old Roger Corman space film, but they accidentally just had a flood overnight, and they're like, guess what? Space floods now, let's just do this. 
I just really hope that the water was not like cold. I just hope the water was warm. I hope the actors didn't freeze to death like they did with the filming of Titanic. So anyway, they're at Acnotica, because that's what I'm going to call it, Acnotica. And they meet the nerd Aaron, and uh, there's a few other people there, and they take like care of a bunch of bull sharks. The biggest one's called Bella, and then they meet the shark trainers, who's Trent, Mike, and Josh, who frankly all sound like a really bad Nickelodeon show. Also, there's a Jaws reference, because Josh is called Hooper. His name's Josh Hooper. And so, I mean, I just, I feel like at least the Jaws reference in Deep Blue Sea 1 was a bit more subtle, except for the ending. The, here's the best part. This happens in the first act. So there's like a Neuralink thing that they have with the sharks, and they push Aaron in the water, and then the sharks are going to attack Aaron, and then they got like, haha, nerd, get in the pool. But it's okay, because of the Neuralink and the sharks. And then they have this little device thing, and they press a button, and then it's fine. And then basically, from... Like, once the first act is done, once you get to, like, 20 minutes in, you're like, okay, let's just start the countdown until all of this falls apart. Like, how long can Acnotica actually survive before it gets flooded and filled with sharks and shit? Instead of, like, a storm, like in the first film, or, like, something natural, which fits the tone and the thematics of the story if you wanted to continue storyline through sequels, which is what good sequels do, the sharks just start to attack stuff. But first, okay, let's talk about the sharks. So I mentioned before, the main shark, the alpha shark, which is not a thing that exists, it's just not a thing. I don't mean like, ooh, alphas don't actually exist. I mean like alpha sharks just aren't a thing. But her name's Bella and she starts acting weird, like most Bellas, like specifically this Bella. But instead of like being into blood like this Bella eventually becomes in Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2, they bring in Mr. Calhoun, which again, I cannot get over that name. They try to get a sample of the shark Bella and then the same thing happens like it does in the first movie, but you know, less impressive. Then everyone kind of just starts to get knocked off one by one, we already knew that. I'm not going to be one of those shitty reviewer people who just like reads the Wikipedia or like watches the movie and then just goes through it beat by beat. We're just going to cut to some of the best moments because this, this film is not worth your time. I think you can already get that from the tone of the way that I'm speaking. Let's just skip to the third act. Let's just skip through all this stuff and the th yeah, just fast forward through this. They get to the end of the film and I gotta say... That's the best part of the film. They blow up the sharks, like in the first movie, and technically Jaws. They get devoured, like in the first movie, and then Acnotica starts to sink. It's just like, it's full of water, and then all this stuff happens. Like, the first movie, pretty much everyone dies, especially Carl Durant, which is great. This is played by a fantastic actor called Michael Beach, who I'll get into a little bit later on. But he's, like, the only justified death in the whole film, and he makes a meal out of it. It just, it feels like it, this is, like, the only real human villain in the film and rather than all of the team members kind of working together to try and deal with the sharks it's just great that Carl Durant that like Michael Beach just does a fantastic job here then there's Misty Calhoun Trent and Aaron they all live and then there's like a bit of sequel bait I hate this so much because the sharks escape to the ocean and they're like they'll be fine but you'd think that like they'd be tagged you'd think they'd be like like it's it would be so good like, there's a great movie concept in there about genetically modified sharks that have to get tracked down. And so then you're kind of doing, like, Jaws, but with more sharks and, I guess, a lower budget and less talent and a worse script. I don't know. I always thought that would be a really, really cool idea to just try and, like, make a movie like Jaws, but it's just set on the ocean and they're just trying to track down sharks. And then the sharks just get bigger and bigger and more terrifying. But I watched this movie and... I've watched it three times, and unfortunately, like I mentioned in the show before, I own the Blu-ray copies for it, so that was a waste of $25. The movie isn't memorable in the slightest, and I skipped over those parts because frankly they're boring, but I will say, genuinely, the only good thing about this film, and the reason I was so excited to watch it again and again, is Michael Beach. Michael Beach has been an actor, he's been around for a long time, he plays Carl Durant, and he chews through the scenery more than the sharks do. The man is a talent. He's just so unhinged. He could basically play a Batman villain, and I'd be like, yeah, it's Michael Beach. He does a sick job. He's fucking insane, dude. Throughout the whole movie, he is so serious and deep in his role of just being a villain that I, he can barely crack a single sarcastic line properly, like this. Your test subjects? Very important test subjects. You know, sharks aren't lab mice. <laughs> I love your passion. In almost any other film, or even a parody of shark films, that would be the film where they would actually show the actors cracking up and they would just leave that in the film. They would even put it at the end of the film like it was a cute little blooper thing. They'd just put it in the film.
the film is not great to say the absolute very least the film looks cheap and like i, I get that they were doing the best they can and they had a couple million and i i i know it's so hard to make a movie and it must be so hard knowing what you're making is going direct to video or direct to streaming that's gotta hurt as a filmmaker like i truly believe no one sets out to make a bad movie i a hundred percent believe that mistakes get made production gets a little bit messy you've got to manage dozens if not hundreds of people look i just feel if you're shooting in cape town and you're filming something that's been in development hell forever and it's a sequel and you've only really got five sets maybe you'd be a little bit depressed about your career choices and maybe you give up at some point but I do appreciate the fact that everybody in this film pretty much commits to who they are and how underwritten their characters are. But it does beg the question, even with those limitations, is Deep Blue Sea 2 any good? Is it a worthy sequel to Deep Blue Sea? No. Are you, are you kidding? Absolutely. Are you serious? Did you not listen to anything I just said in the past 10 minutes? No one could say this is a good shark movie, let alone a good movie. It's an okay movie, it's technically a movie, it's runtime and the fact that it's celluloid or I guess digitally rendered film onto a cinematic sequence, sure, it's a movie. But could I, would I recommend it? Absolutely not. It's just not good. It qualifies as a movie technically. But honestly, it looks like one of those asylum features or like sci-fi original films that comes out like the same week as big release movies, like those mockbusters. Like instead of Deep Blue Sea, if this came out in 1999 and calling it like Gaping Aqua Ocean or some stupid shit like that, and then like your grandmother picks it up because it's like $2 and is like, well, make a leg shark movie, so might as well get some shark movies for it. That's, that's how I feel. It's, it's insane that this is a real, official, no fucking around, multi-million dollar sequel to a film that, frankly, I felt didn't really need a sequel. I don't think anybody was really asking for a sequel to Deep Blue Sea, except for the producers, except for Warner Brothers. This was clearly a tax write-off, and we know now that they love tax write-offs, and the way that they could stay somewhat relevant. Wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. Despite the fact that Warner Brothers already has a huge shark hit on their hands just four months away from releasing, it's insane that they decided to go ahead with Deep Blue Sea 2. Ultimately, I think that they were just hedging their bets. They felt maybe that if they could make a Deep Blue Sea 2 and it made bank, maybe they could make a Deep Blue Sea 3. Maybe they could just stay in the cultural consciousness just a little bit more, showing that shark films were still relevant in cinemas and in home media. Maybe just maybe, Deep Blue C2 was a $5 million investment just to make sure the Meg would succeed. Which, look, at some point I may talk about the Meg and the Meg 2 down the track, but I those are a whole other kettle of fish, or in this case a kettle of sharks. The Meg obviously did quite well in 2018. It made it over a half a billion dollars. It was literally the 16th highest grossing movie of that year worldwide. And yet, it still seems insane that they still went ahead with Deep Blue Sea 2, but I guess it might be a sunk cost fallacy. But that's just my opinion on it. How did people, how did regular normal film going people feel about Deep Blue Sea 2? Holy sh- oh my god. Wow. That's really bad. Like, I knew this was pretty rough. Like, sure, a lot of direct-to-video get 0%. Actually, you know what? This is just Rotten Tomatoes. Let's check the audience. Oh, my God! Oh, boy. This is not good at all. Like, we saw Deep Blue Sea 1 at a fresh 60%. Like, that was good. I put that screenshot in there because I was like, hey, for a film in 1999, not that bad. Pretty good. Great rating. And I look, I think 60%, pretty good. For an average film, like a B-movie, pretty great. Pretty high praise for a shark movie. Here's a bunch of shark movies that didn't do so well and that barely made 50%. If you can break 50% and you're a shark movie, that's fine. Not everyone's in the mood for a shark movie. It's not gonna be crowd pleaser, but 0% is so rare. There's like less than 50 theatrically released films in the history of film. Over a hundred years of cinema, tens of thousands of films, and yet so few get to reach 0%. In fact, the only other fucking shark film that I can think of, and I know I don't have to look this up, but I'm going to look it up anyway, I'm going to show it to you on screen. The only other shark film is Jaws 4, The Revenge with Michael Caine and the wife from the first movie. I These reviews are so brutal, too. And to be honest, I have to agree. None of this makes sense. Dull, janky, straight-to-video fodder. Deep Blue Sea 2 is a wet course fin slap to the face of its far superior and infinitely more fun original shark thriller. Yes, I 100% agree, but damn, this is brutal. Just 
Oh my god, okay, let's just check IMDb. Holy shit, even the movie, this movie has a 3.4. That's, okay, that's okay. It's just below Crossroads with Britney Spears and just above the first Sharknado movie, which is heartbreaking because Sharknado, that whole franchise is not that good. That's a whole other tangent. I'm not going to go into that. Oh, but did this movie make money? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it did. Based on the budget, all those South African tax breaks, the movie did well when it came out on VOD, DVD, and Blu-ray. When it was released in April of 2018, Deep Blue Sea 2 landed at number 8 overall and number 11 on the Blu-ray charts, beating out the likes of Pitch Perfect 3 and Proud Mary, big films that did very, very well on video on demand and streaming that year. I, I will say Deep Blue Sea took in just over $1.6 million on DVD and Blu-ray sales in just the first month. So if you were to compound that over a couple of weeks, if not a couple of months, I would say Deep Blue Sea 2 probably made its budget back and then some. This also doesn't even include the amount made from VOD. Deep Blue Sea 2 somehow debuted at number 10 on the Microsoft Store VOD. I don't know why I have these stats, but I just do. It stayed in the top 10 even after the critically maligned Matt Damon vehicle Downsizing was released, which was pretty big on streaming and DVD after it didn't do so well theatrically. But the real question is, did Deep Blue Sea 2 do well enough to warrant a sequel? The answer is yes. And was that the conscious decision where somebody in a Warner Brothers boardroom asked, hey, what if we did Deep Blue Sea 3? And everybody nodded, and Deep Blue Sea 3 was greenlit. So how in the hell did this movie come to be? Oh, I guess we, I guess we kind of already answered that in a sarcastic way. Well, anyway, this is Deep Blue Sea 3. First things first, uh, somehow looking at the Warner Brothers fandom wiki, which I, I guess is kind of a trusted source. Oh, there's no listing for it. My one resource to all of the things surrounding Deep Blue Sea 3 is either the Wikipedia page, which anyone can edit, or Warner Brothers themselves. It's just really not there. I did find it on Super Epic Fail Wikipedia. Seriously though, Deep Blue Sea 3 uh, happened because Deep Blue Sea 2 happened. It's as simple as that. Warner Brothers Home Entertainment greenlit the film back in 2019 and they began filming in, oh, Cape Town, South Africa again. Okay, great. Well, that, that did great for the second one. They'll be great for the third one. Honestly, there's so little about this movie or the production or anything major about Deep Blue Sea 3. I thought watching through these two featurettes on the Blu-ray, Sinking Sets and Sharks, the making of Deep Blue Sea 3, or Deep Blue Sea 3 bite to the end, but it's not. It's just like typical special feature fare and it's like people enjoying themselves and how they built the set and it's it's great I think it's fine as a featurette it's it's exactly the kind of stuff that you buy blu-rays and dvds for but it's I think the most entertaining thing and I, I mean entertaining in the more general sense is about how abstract the PR patter directly from WB is for Deep Blue C3 it, it honestly feels like and this is way before you know the era of AI that we're in now this is obviously over five years ago but it sounds like it's written by an AI listen listen to this <clears throat> the Deep Blue Sea franchise has developed the cult following for over two decades said Mary Ellen Thomas, Warner Brothers Home Entertainment Senior Vice President of Originals Animation and Family Marketing. With Deep Blue Sea 3, we deliver all the shark action fans love and we know that it will be a hit with both new and existing fans of the franchise. Okay, cool. Um, I, you can't, I, ju I just feel like so much of this is just so generic. It's so boring. That's why I mentioned the AI thing. It just sounds so not exciting. You could take the, the the number three and the references to the first two films out of this press release. It could have been a press release from late 1998 or early 1999 that you would see in Variety. Deep Blue Sea 3 is directed by John Pogue, a guy with a track record of actually making pretty good sequels and blockbuster movies like Quarantine and the sequel to Eraser for some reason. And it was written by Dirk Blackman, one of the guys who I keep seeing credited for the Underworld series who's keeping that alive with Kate Beckinsale. So I would say, safer hands than Deep Blue Sea 2. I kind of know these people, but I only really know them from the fact that sometimes I get a little bit wasted and I watch terrible sequels and then I rate them on Letterboxd while I'm wasted. What exactly is Deep Blue Sea 3 about now that we've learned how it came to be? All right, so by the time you get to Deep Blue Sea 3, you're already at a point where you're like, okay, so the sharks are big and they're terrifying. What can we do in this film franchise? And you think, let's make things gory out. let's have bigger sharks let's make it more campy let's bring back the chef let's you know let's do all these things that made the first one great and they don't do any of that but i will say i did have a far better time with deep blue c3 than i did with deep blue c2 we meet our protagonist emma collins which is unfortunately less of a poor name than misty calhoun but she's already working on a man-made island called little happy off the coast of mozambique 
which is in South Africa, so, you know, no tax breaks. The best thing about this movie is that the film starts on their own aquatica, and it, calling something a little happy and knowing what the film is, pretty funny. Great use of irony. Really appreciate that. That's great. On top of that, I noticed there's two things that every single Deeply Sea movie has to have. One, a couple that's pretty much in love and will almost 100% die before the credits roll because that's sad. We have the two neurological students in the second one and then these two in the third one who are kind of a couple but not really but they flirt together. And then the second one is that you always have to have a pretty bad reference to Jaws. This character, Eugene, played by Emerson Brooks, shares the last name with actor Robert Shaw who plays Quint in Jaws. So it's kind of a loose reference. No, again, like I said, not really a great reference but it's there back to deep blue c3 and how fun the film is i have to say tanya raymond as emma collins pretty great way better actor than she deserves to be in this film she's not afraid to be unlikable like saffron burrows in the original deep blue sea and they don't try to make her likable either she's really fun to have as a character that she's capable to do things herself and she's committed to what she cares about and she feels like a real boss i've had bosses who i get along with but also they have to kind of clamp down on you and it feels like she's actually running things and running them properly unlike the people in deep blue sea 2 she gives a shit about the whole animal preservation shark side of things and the climate change of things and it comes through really well raymond carries this character like a bitch and a girl boss and she does a really good job of it then we introduce some of the other characters who are basically just chum the spin and maya and richard who's technically emma's ex-boyfriend they kind of pick up that lost little plot point from the first film and then they kind of put it in here and it's fine uh, then there's bahari nandi and then there's lucas and his mercenaries i kind of take up some of the stuff that was originally going to be in deep blue sea 2 the original script by john perez and they kind of added in here but it's all pretty bleh. it's like it's not that great Bahari who I really love great character is played by Saya Mayola which I'm pretty sure I butchered that name he dies in the middle of the film spoilers but I have to say the deaths in this film are absolutely incredible and they're really goofy like they're goofy because I feel like they knew what they were doing I feel like they amped up the camp in this film and it's great and I love this scene here where <laughs> where Richard dies I would rather die with her than live like you. This is this is great. I love this. And like I mentioned at the end of Deep Blue Sea 2, Deep Blue Sea 3 actually takes that sequel bait from Deep Blue Sea 2, or essentially shark bait, shark sequel bait. There is something so deeply stupid and horrible that fired in my brain when they said the name Bella. It's Bella. Like, it was like a member berries nostalgia thing, and I was like, what, Bella, where have I heard that? Oh my god, they're actually doing the thing. They're doing the thing from the second movie. Holy shit! And I, not to bring my own trauma into this, because I've seen the Twilight films multiple times for a multitude of reasons, but they do bring back Bella and the other sharks. And, I mean, look, Bella is now like a shark terrorist, and she's destroying the ecosystem around Little Happy, and you're like, oh, it's Bella, Bella's doing this, oh my god, Bella. And then they find out, Bella is dead, yeah, I found her yesterday. Deceased. Just trying to figure out if I can learn anything. And her kids, Bella's kids, are the ones that Emma Collins is taking care of. So she now has to have this horrible internal conflict of like, I gotta take care of these sharks, I gotta be a conservationist, but also, my whole team could fucking die. And it's great. It brings it back to that man versus nature probe from the first movie. And I, I really like this. I really, really like this. There's like these themes and these concepts of motherhood and mother nature, and they build up. They actually like, they get you kind of interested and excited about it. And the dialogue helps with that. And the characterization helps a little bit for that. And it kind of, it doesn't really build up too much because it's deep blue sea. Like she cares for her sharks, but she cares for her crew. And like playing off that is really interesting. But then once they bring in the mercenaries and Lucas into the picture, and then it's like, oh, I guess the sharks aren't the real villains of these guys. But I really do think there's a lot of great tension. There's a lot better acting. There's a, there's a little bit of overacting, but I still like it. Yeah. And I have to say, the set of Little Happy is astounding. It's so fun. It's so fucking incredible. You really feel whoever built this really put a lot of work and thought into this like they did with the original Aquatica. It's so great to see, especially in the wide shots where it's just like, okay, this, this feels real. This feels like a place that's lived in. And that doesn't feel like, oh, they built this like in a couple of weeks for this film. It feels like Little Happy is a place you could visit and live on. But... Out of all of that, of the discussions, of writing, and character design, and campiness, is Deep Blue Sea 3 any good? I really hate to say this, but yes, the movie 
is good. It's a fun, ridiculous, creative, and brilliant bit of shark B-movie fodder. Now, is it as good as the first film? No. If you look at the Rotten Tomato score, which again we'll get into, you would imagine that a Deep Blue Sea 3 is better than Deep Blue Sea 1, and I cannot say that. I Deep down, forget nostalgia, I cannot say that 3 is better than 1. But I feel like the directors, the writers, the production team, the actors, they all knew what they were making. Yes, it's going to be a directed DVD, directed Blu-ray, bit of schlock, but it's great. Deep Blue Sea as a franchise, I guess, is more of a over-the-top throwback to the creature features of the 1970s and 1980s. Gorefest that really relied on man vs. nature style B-plots with a pretty okay level of acting, they rely more on their shock value than their budget. And I feel like they really accomplished that with Deep Blue Sea 3. I know that the budget for this film would have been definitely less than $5 million, but I really feel that as a Deep Blue Sea film, as a B-movie, as a creature feature, it's pretty good. The only real three things that let me down were the effects, some of the dialogue, and the score. The dialogue is laughable and does feel a little bit improvised here and there, and there's, that kind of adds to the charm of the film in some cases, but some of them are just like, oh, I just, I, I feel like the, the script got wet that day and you were just like, yeah, let's go with this. Or the fact that the script could have just gone through another draft. At Bella, it was tagged with an acoustic to radio conversion beacon. Wow, that, that's a really tricky piece of tech. The film is also just under 100 minutes long, which is fine, but I feel like with a bit more editing, it could have been a tight 90. Just, just, just a few scenes that could have been cut down here or there, or maybe the writing could have been a little bit tighter. Anyway, I do think that the score is pretty rough overall. It's very, very generic. I, I, I kind of wish they brought back the motif from the original film. I mentioned Warner Brothers, or at least Warner Music, has the rights to that. I don't understand why they can't do that. I really wish they kept evolving the score. Kind of had like a thing that was just like Bella's theme, and it's just this terrifying use of the original score. I, look, I deep down, I really liked Deep Blue Sea 3. It's a really fun watch. Not even in a so bad it's good way, which it kind of is, but I really feel like everyone was just ranking everything up to 110% and it shows on screen. The deaths are funny and silly. The set is incredible. The characters are pretty fun. The movement and editing are on pace with most other action films. And honestly, it never overstays its runtime. I ended up watching this film a lot more than the second film, that's for sure. It's crazy to say, but you could honestly just skip Deep Blue Sea 2 and maybe just, I don't know, watch this review or read a Wikipedia entry or just have someone tell you, hey, uh, that shark Bella that they're talking about? Oh yeah, she was in Deep Blue Sea 2 and she escaped the facility. Oh, and here's a compilation of Michael Beach going crazy. I love your passion. Who did that to Craig? Once my research is completed, I will end them. That's all you need to know to really enjoy Deep Blue Sea 3. But how did other people actually feel about the film? So, as I mentioned before with the Rotten Tomatoes score, people really loved this film. And I don't... Because it was released during the pandemic, I think maybe they were amped for it and they were so excited. And also the trailer did really, really well on YouTube. This was released basically in the middle of the pandemic in 2020. And some critics were saying it was charming and enthralling and just a bit of spectacle with bits of blood and gore. And it did quite well. And ch going, let's go to IMDb. The film has 4.7, the same rating as one of the funniest and greatest movies of the 21st century, Criterion's very own, Ready Got Fingered. And even on Letterboxd, the film has a 2.3. I think, eh, that's pretty bad. But then you look at the first Deep Blue Sea, which has only half a point higher at 2.8. Like, for a relative film franchise where two out of the three entries were directed video sequels, that's pretty good. The film series has only gotten a bit more ridiculous over time, but I have to say that it's a lot more memorable. I think one and three, pretty great. One, if you had to rank them, it would obviously go one, three, two. But financially, things didn't look that great. The film made just under $800,000 from home media sales, and it really did not do great on VOD or streaming. What's really funny, and I absolutely love when studios do this, it was put out on DVD and on Blu-ray, despite the fact that they'd already released Deep Blue Sea 1 and 2 in a DVD and a Blu-ray pack, but then afterwards, then they released a trilogy set, which is super weird and great. I, I think it would be so funny to imagine a bigger fan of Deep Blue Sea than I am, who gets the original film and then gets two as a separate one. And then the third one comes out and he's like, oh man, now I gotta get this other two pack. And then the trilogy comes back out and he's like, oh man, what the fuck? 
is god damn it deep blue sea 3 is a good movie not a great movie but it's pretty good i have to say there will be nothing that will ever capture the first deep blue sea the editing the cinematography the effects and the acting may have been a lightning in a bottle situation deep blue sea is still ranked the sixth highest grossing shark movie of all time behind jaws 2 somehow and the meg i feel as though the meg is also not a great film but for a wide range of different reasons that maybe one day i'll go into but deep blue sea really does capture tension the horror and the absolutely fascinating nature of shark and that ultimately maybe we didn't need the sequels to explain that further. I'm not super grateful that there are two sequels to Deep Blue Sea. It genuinely feels like a waste of about $10 million. If 3 didn't exist on Little Happy, I feel like it could have been its own shark film. Maybe don't call it Little Happy, but I doubt it would have made money before or even after the pandemic. The Deep Blue Sea trilogy feels like a failure, not only to capture the moment, but to actually understand why the first one worked. I guess no one will ever make a good shark sequel, like ever, which kind of sucks. Like seriously, Jaws 2, in fact, all the Jaws sequels, and the Meg 2, I mean, that sucks. There's also 47 meters down, which I haven't seen, but I haven't heard is very good. And then there's a sequel to that. There's also all the open water films, which I want to cover at some point, but even then that's, that's crazy that there's three of those films. The main thing is, it's just sad because there is a chance out there to make a really good shark sequel one day, but it's not here in the deep blue sea. And that's it now. I, I guess it's weird because deep blue sea three is a really, engaging and fascinating film it's basically a retread of the first film but instead of alzheimer's they're focusing on climate change which i guess is a lot more relevant because we are kind of going through this ever increasing climate catastrophe that we can't stop or do anything about which is also terrifying and real and topical and honestly it brings a lot of heart and believability to the film it makes her a lot more relatable to some degree i feel like emma collins is a pretty great character i don't know it worked on me okay because i'm a fucking lefty piece of shit with my heart on my sleeve i actually watched this a couple of times out of my own accord just to stop me from watching Deep Blue Sea 2 and getting mad at it and bored. And I guess, well, I couldn't recommend Deep Blue Sea 2. I would absolutely recommend Deep Blue Sea 3. And obviously I would recommend Deep Blue Sea 1. Can you just go from Deep Blue Sea 1 to 3? Yeah, absolutely you could. I, I gave you a methodology to do that before. I wouldn't recommend it, but you totally could. You could dress up like a shark and go diving and live in the mouth of a whale for all I care. But again, wouldn't recommend Deep Blue Sea 2. I just feel like there has to be a way that you can dance that film into like 20 minutes or less and put it in the middle of a review. Anyway, that's it. That's all I have to say. I don't think I have much else to say about this franchise. I think I think the fact that this video is over an hour long is insane. But I thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, I really wanted to do another video like this, very, very similar to my Death Witch video and my Cats video, where I'm kind of just trying to explain the context and the kind of how I feel about the film. I, I do feel as though that like, you know, sharks still scare me and, and uh, I still have the lassophobia, but I think watching these films over and over again kind of helped out that a little bit. I wouldn't say I'm cured, but I think ultimately the people I need to thank are my patron because there's a lot of stuck footage here and this whole thing took months to make. I originally started this, the original draft of the script started in 2021 and then I finished it over a, a long weekend and I'm so glad that I could just record all of this audio get all this footage together i'm so glad you're watching this now i'm gonna take a little break for a bit because these videos take a lot out of me and also you know tax season's coming up and i have a, a bunch of other stuff i have to do at work but again thank you so much to my patrons this was honestly such a great way to jump back into this after doing a lot of stuff with the vhs franchise i will want to make something around the abcs of death i, I, I was thinking of maybe doing that this year because there hasn't been a, a new vhs announced at least at the time of recording this i'll put it up on screen if there has been Okay, cool. The most expensive part to, for, for this thing was uh, buying the Blu-ray collection of Deep Blue Sea. Like I mentioned, that was about 25 bucks. Which, thanks to the death of streaming, you know, was nearly 30 bucks, but luckily I found a guy on Facebook Marketplace. So look, if you could throw a single dollar over on patreon.com i know these videos don't get that many views but there's literally thousands of people who watch this that's a hundred dollars and that's pretty great and i have a bunch of patreon goals that i really want to do and there's a bunch of stuff that i secretly mentioned in this video that i could also do that would be sick i also think that it's crazy that i, I mean i was going to buy the blu-ray collection regardless because you know it's i really like to support filmmakers when i do these reviews i think it's the least that i can do but at the time of writing this in australia only deep blue c1 is available to stream on stan that's crazy right there's three of these films and two of them were basically made for streaming but i then looked up right in the us they 
only, and again, this is at the recording. This is this is in April when I'm putting all this together. In the US, just the first Deep Blue Sea is available. That's wild. Two and three, which Warner Brothers specifically made, not available for streaming. Like, you can buy them, sure. You can get them on fucking Apple Plus or whatever the fucking, that, that's called iTunes. But they're Warner Brothers films. Shouldn't they just be on HBO Max? Like, that makes sense, right? Thank you so much for watching. Please support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash help Harrison. That will help me a lot. Sorry, it's been so long between this and my last video. I had a lot of work stuff, a lot of personal stuff I've been dealing with, but I'm so, so happy that this is out and that you're watching this. I love you all so much. Please subscribe, please like and subscribe. That helps me out so much. See you next time. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day. Stay safe. Don't go in the ocean. Just don't. Why, well, there's nothing in there. Don't go in the ocean. Don't go in the deep blue sea. First, we're gonna seal up.